for the little introduction that we, we have for all of our interviews. So, good afternoon. My name is Liliana Rodriguez. Today is February 11th, 2020. I am in Corpus Christi, Texas, interviewing Mr. Noe Mendez for the Voces Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Mendez, for agreeing to be interviewed by our project. Please know that if there are topics that you do not wish to discuss, you will not have to discuss them. Also, if there is something you wish to discuss, we want to hear from you. If at any point you wish to stop the camera to get a drink or use the facilities, please let us know. As we said earlier, your interview will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Library at the University of Texas at Austin campus. So let's begin. Can you tell us about your childhood? What was your daily life like? Before the service. Mm -hmm. You were telling me before the interview where you were born. Can mm -hmm. you tell me about that? Well, I was born in Tampico, Mexico. My father was working there for a British company and uh, I was brought back to the United States at the age of 40 days. And, uh, and I was raised in a small town west of Corpus Christi, about 60, 70 miles from here, by the name of Benavides. But many of those years we spent at the ranch, my grandfather's ranch. It's been in the family for about 150 years, and uh, and we were raised in a small town of about 1,700 population, and uh, it, it was a hard life. Uh, uh, it was not industry or anything, and, and we learned from very young how to move around. And, and work hard. We all come from a hard working family. And at the age of 17, I dropped out of school at the age of eighth grade. And I decided to take a course in, all my uncles were mechanics, automobile mechanics, and uh, some had uh, water well drilling for water in different areas. and. And I even had one drilling for oil, and uh, and I always liked aircraft. I was crazy about going to the Air, Air Corps. So at the age of 17, I took a course in aircraft engine mechanics. I, th I came to Corpus and worked at the at the Naval Air Station, at the at the airport as a inspector for a small planes for the Civil Air Patrol. Civilian Air Patrol. At that time, there was a, a a squadron of civilian air patrol that were supposed to move around the Gulf, uh, chasing German submarines. The war uh, started, and and I finished school with high grades, so I was sent to the air to the airport to inspect uh, small planes. From there, I turned 18 and I was ready to go to the service site. I went and, and inducted me into the service, the United States Army. And uh, I asked to go to the Air Corps. At that time, says, well, everybody that goes into the Army takes infantry training. So I took the training, came out of there with 14 week training, and I was sent back home for a five day uh, de delaying route on my way to New York. So after after completing my my five days there with my family, uh, we were have to come to Corpus and and report at the Missouri Pacific Railroad. And there we mounted on a train, we were about 50, and when I went, a group of about 50 and 
About 60% were Hispanics, Mexican Americans from the west side, from from the west part of Texas, all the way from San Antonio, Del Rio, uh, El Paso. We had some from El Paso and the Valley. So that train shoot shoot all the way to New York. Two days and about three nights or something like that, and we. It was a rough ride because it was not a Pullman or a sleeping quarters or not. We were just sitting there and and for meals we, we got two meals a day. It was a, a bag of a sandwich and an apple and an orange or a banana and, and that was it. So arriving in New York, uh, we were the first ones to arrive there and they were loading up a ship to go to Europe. And uh, and we were assigned to be to manage the guns. On the, in fact, it was the Queen Mary. There was a, about eighteen thousand soldiers, and we were assigned to be uh, to manage the guns because the United States had some kind of arrangement with England that they would furnish the transportation or the ship going across, and and we were. To manage the guns, it was a hard, hard deal. It was six days sitting on a gun aircraft. I was assigned to one of the guns. I was an aircraft gun. So uh, we arrived in Liverpool, England, and we were uh, to report to a, another train station. It took us across England to the English Channel. And there we, we, we were mounting on another ship going across the channel. At arriving in the French coast, see we arrived there after the D-Day. We, we were not there during the D-Day. By the time, by the time I moved to the front lines or to Germany, our troops were already pushing out of Paris, France. We were on the way to Belgium, Luxembourg, in that area. And we fought that Hargan Forest in Belgium. That was a very hard, very hard, because the, the Germans knew that we were replacements, and we were coming in as replacements, because they had, in, they were um, hard, Barely need a replacement. So we moved into the other area and the Germans bombarded us every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes. We were getting all kinds of food. We lost at least half of the boys that were in my group. And uh, it was a terrible thing. It was uh, the bombardment every 30 minutes. They went. We spent 28 days in there. In the, in the front line, my regiment and my battalion, uh, without a rest, without change of clothes, or without good meals or hot meals or nothing, we we were in the belt in the front line 28 days. After 28 days, we uh, we were given a 10-day rest, and they pulled us back from the front lines. I, by that time, I had already lost most of my buddies that were, that went with me from from here. So, so I was just learning to live with everybody else that, that I didn't know and trusting everybody else because you had to trust everybody. Everybody had guns and grenades, and we moved into a, an area there in Belgium for a 10-day rest. So we were just to, about the third day. We, we were just cleaning up and dressing up and getting ready to go back for a 10-day vacation. But the third day that I was there, by that time I was assigned to a machine gun squad. 
air cooled machine gun squad, a small caliber. And uh, we clean our guns and our clothes and change our clothes and clean up. Three days, we were told to go back to get ready and pick up all the ammunition we could because the Germans were coming. They had broke the lines. That was called the Battle of the Bulge. It started on uh, December the 19th. And we were told to get ready and hop in the truck and go back to the front line. We were just about 15 miles behind the, the lines at that time. And uh, in that battle, I was wounded pretty bad. And, uh, and uh, I, went, I went on for a few days and my wounds turned into gangrene and, and, and I was sent back to England to, for, for two months in the hospital. And then I came back, they, I came back to the front lines and, uh, and we, we moved across Cologne, Aachen, in those towns there, small German towns. And we went in, in on to Germany. And uh, at the end, we fought all, I got three bronze stars. I, I, I went to three battles. It was the Battle of the Bulge, the Hargan Forest, and the Central Europe. I don't know how I survived, but I guess the good Lord didn't need me over there and send me back to, to tell people about what went on. And, and uh, I ended up in Nuremberg, Germany, all the way to Nuremberg, Germany, when we met the Russians coming from the east. The, the war, the war was about over. We, when the war was over, I was in, in the area of uh, Nuremberg, and we met with the Russians, and we celebrated for about three days, two, three days, drinking a lot of vodka and just crazy. So we set up camp in Nuremberg. During that time, I was assigned to as a guard at the Nuremberg Trials. When they were bringing on the criminal, war criminals, and they were rounding up the criminals, and, and we were supposed to keep an eye on those people and, and, and guard them day and night. After a week or two, I was called back to the captain's office, and they were in need of a transportation officer in Frankfurt, Germany. And I was asked if I would go back to Frankfurt and manage a transportation company, and I was assigned 16 men. I was promoted to sergeant, and I was assigned 16 men and seven army vehicles. So I went back to, to Frankfurt and spent the rest of my time there. Uh, rest of my time, because it was about 10 months or a year, where I operated that transportation company. And uh, it was not easy because we were supposed to move men and supplies. Uh, there was no, no transportation at that time because the streets were all bombed, the bridges were all down, and the roads were all destroyed. But anyway, apparently I did a good job because they were very happy with what I was doing because I uh, managed to pick up a German prisoner that had been uh, young, about my age, and, and he was, he was, he, they were surrendered and they didn't, they didn't want no problem. I said, you don't give us no problem and we don't give you no problem. We, we need to learn to, we're not, we're not bad people. We're, we're here because we have to be here and do what, the job that we had to do. And he offered me to help me uh, around, to move around my vehicles and around Germany and all that area there. 
His name was Rodolfo Rudy. And he had a young wife and two babies, two baby girls. And he said, well, uh, I'll do whatever, whatever you want me to do. I'll work for you day and night, and I'll help you all the way I can. That's the kind of a person he was. And he was about my size. So I, I was breaking the, the Army regulations. I, I dressed him as a, an American soldier so he could ride around with me and, and help me out. And I was doing a good job because the help of, of this German, he spoke better English than I did. He spoke English in German. And, well, anyway, I took his wife and his kids to a safe place because it was, it was very hard to, at that time, to, to hold on to a pretty wife. He had a pretty young wife, and, and the soldiers were all abusing of people and everything. You know. So anyway, I went through, he, he dressed me up, he had my tailor-made boots, he had, uh, he had, he helped me out in camp with everything, all the needs for my people, for my drivers. So, it went on very smooth there. Uh, some of the Americans didn't like uh, the idea that I, that I had a German doing the work. <laughs> But, but I found it a good way to do it. Then I had another Italian boy that was a young guy too. I didn't, I dropped out of eighth grade. I couldn't write tickets or reports or anything. So, so I got him at the office. I set up an office for him and he was doing all my paperwork. And then I had a good cook and, and, and I was just living like a king, like a little king. <laughs> and I was very well liked in that area in Germany. In fact, I don't know why, but the Germans were, trust us Hispanics more than they did the other, the other Germans or, or the other Americans. <laughs> so I, I, that's why I say I, I didn't have no problem with the Germans. I like Germany. I almost stayed over there. But I had to come back because my mama want, wanted me back. But, but I was, I had a motorcycle. I had an Opel car. I had my, my own personal Jeep. The picture is there. And so, so I was like a little king there. I went to Switzerland. I went to all over Germany. And uh, I'll tell you, it was, it was uh, like a dream. Uh, after 70 years, I still dream that <laughs> I think I'm going to go back. <laughs> some, some of my girls were not there no more. They will not be there no more. I'm not, in April, I'll be 95 years old. So. Um, you mentioned your fa your mother, so I'm going to ask about your family. Mm -hmm. Who Do you have brothers and sisters? My sister is Marcela, and my brother is Roy. And Roy was sent to the Pacific. He was, he was in something real. But at that time, that when I got wounded, for a while they didn't know where I was. They had picked me up, and sent me back to the hospital. And uh, like I said, I don't know how they found my brother on the way to the Pacific. He, they were, they were getting ready to invade Japan. And they brought him back home to my mother because my mother had received a telegram that I was not, that I was missing in action. And they didn't think I was alive. So they thought I would. So, so they brought him back from, he came back home, he didn't know what he was all about. He said, he said your brother is, and uh, after a while, I was strong enough or able to write a note home that I was at a, that I was at a, I was at a hospital and that I was going to be all right. 
So, so they sent my brother back to, to, to the Philippines, to Guam first and then to the Philippines. And, and like I said, I didn't know this till about four or five years ago. My brother said, they brought me back and I didn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Those things happen. I, I don't know how they found out either. But they hadn't, my mother, nobody had received mail or, or a notice from, from the army that I, that I was still alive. Are you the oldest? Yes. So it's My you? sister is the oldest. So it's your sister? She's 97 and, my, and I'm 94 and my brother is 93. 93. Um, did you have to take care of Roy growing up? Or what was the relationship between you and Roy? Or your sister, did she take care of you all? My sister took care of my mother. My, my, my mother almost died because we were both gone. Mm -hmm. And she didn't hear from us. And she, was, she, she was, my sister wrote me a letter saying that, that my mother was taking it real hard. She couldn't sleep at night. And uh, yeah. I can, I can imagine how hard it was for the mothers and the wives. I had a lot of soldiers fighting with us that had two and three kids at home and a wife. But we didn't realize how hard it was for them because because they were crying at night. You know, it was it was very hard. I had one in my company. That was crying one night, and they asked me go and see after James. I think it was his name. And says he's crying, and he's going to commit. He wants to commit suicide. And I was just 19 years old. I had to go babysit all night with him, trying to convince him not to kill himself, because he had received a letter that his wife was going to have a baby. And he, and he said, I haven't been home in three years. How can that happen? So he, he took it real hard. I had to send him to the hospital. I had to put somebody on guard to, to, keep, to keep him from committing suicide. I didn't know, how, I don't know how well, what I told him during the night where he, where I had to stay with him all night, and 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 cases like that, you know, where that that, that things like many such stories, I'm sure from comrades or or other veterans that. I, that we didn't realize how hard it would be for the, well, the, the, the man that had two and three kids already and, uh, and a wife back home. I had a, a cousin that was, had four kids at home and he was sent to, to Japan. And, uh, and, and many, many more who were a lot older than I was, than we were. We were very young. I was 19 years when, I was, when all this was going on. So you were one of the younger ones. So what memories do you have growing up uh, as a, in your childhood? What kind of things did you grow up doing with your sister and your brother? I was picking cotton. I was helping pick up corn and feeding the pigs, the chickens, and all that kind of stuff. Since we were about 12 years old, milking cows. And that's how we... Uh, I don't remember they were being hungry because my mother always was cooking and preparing meals for us and we had we had milk cows and we had pigs and all kind of stuff. It was right after the depression and, and, and it was hard those days. It, it, there was no money at all. It was, it was just hard life but but we enjoyed it. it was not even electric lights. So we had to go to bed early and uh, Soon sundown bed, and uh, 
But I don't remember living a hard life. It was it was okay. <laughs> what did your parents do? Uh, well, my dad was repairing uh, windmills and machines, and he was all, all my uncles were mechanically inclined, and uh, and that's why we took the aircraft engines. I, I always liked airplanes. In fact, I still have a friend that has a plane we fly around, and and we, uh, and then I came back and worked at the Naval Air Station for a while. And your mother? My mother passed away at at, at the age of one hundred, and my father passed away at the age of ninety-three. So. So your mother uh, stayed at home. Mm -hmm. My mother was part of. Part of uh, Apache Indian, half Apache Indian, and Spaniard. What memories do you have of your parents? That they were hardworking people and very honest, and they always cared for people. They were helping each other, and, and it was a it was, like I said, it was a hard life. It was no money. And uh, at that time, discrimination against us, the Hispanics, was hard, especially in South Texas. We didn't get any high paying jobs or anything like that. It was very hard. It, it, I, that's why when I came back, I got involved in all kinds of uh, helping people along. And I served in the Park and Recreation, and I served as a Planning and Zoning Commissioner, and I have served in the National Urban Coalition, and I served in many other areas, the United Way. I, I'm a volunteer for United Way for nine years. At this time, I'm helping with the Chamber of Commerce. I got involved in everything I could just to because the good Lord brought me back, and I figured that I had brought me back for some reason. I have to do something. Well, let me tell you another thing that happened there. A general Patton, I was served on the general Patton. When I was in Frankfurt, Germany, as a transportation officer, they came. We didn't have any communications or phones. Or, barely had one phone for my office at that time. I received a message that says, Mendes, you need to go and see about General Patton. He got killed and one of your trucks killed General Patton. And uh, I didn't pay much attention to it because I knew I had only one truck. It was on a Sunday. And I had only one truck out that day and it was running north of Frankfurt. And the accident occurred south of Frankfurt. So I didn't pay much attention, and I, I didn't want to go. So we had been all night. It was on a, on a Sunday morning. Saturday night, we were all night playing cards and drinking beer and stuff like that. And, uh, and I didn't want to go. And here comes another message. Says, you need to go check it out. One of your trucks killed the general. The, one of, a truck just like mine hit the general's jeep, not jeep, general's car. It was a command car. And uh, so I went to I went to Heidelberg where the general had the accident. By the time I got there, they had already picked him up and took him to another small aid station. Then they picked him up and took him. They couldn't find, it was on a Sunday morning. They couldn't find a doctor. They couldn't find nobody to help him. And he got to, by the time they, he got to Heidelberg, it was not too far from there, the general uh, uh, died uh, 12 days later. And uh, I wrote it an article somewhere about, about all this, I don't have it with me. 
that the general uh, general pattern was something that still goes through my mind all the time that he was such a powerful man, such a big general, and, and nobody wants to nobody wants to say anything about it. In fact, everybody I have talked to don't know what happened to John Pat. Oh, he was killed in the jeep. He oh, he was not a jeep. He never had a jeep. He he was he had gone. He had been in in my area about an hour before he got killed. He drove by across my area because he was he was living in the opposite side of Frankfurt. And he was coming across my camp, going bird hunting. He was going bird hunting, uh, pheasant hunting. And the accident occurred at an intersection, not, not even an intersection, it was a drunk, a drunk driver by the name of Thompson. He, he had the same rank that I had, we were both sergeants. And he had stolen a truck in my area close to my area, and they thought it was one of my trucks. That's why I was asked to come and investigate the case, and they were saying it was, and I figured, well, you know, I guess they're ready to, to blame a Mexican or a Hispanic. <laughs> so it, it's funny that, that nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to know the real truth about it. I know because I was there. and and. Uh, and being such, he was the top general in the world, not only in the United States. Such a powerful man, and he, he was very hard. He, he, we, we didn't like the way he was treating us, but, but a man that has to move over a million men, he has to be tough. So that later, I, later I respected that. I, I gave him credit. He was moving over a million men. And, uh, and a lot of army equipment. So the man had to, had to be tough. He was tough. And that's why we didn't care too much about him. You know, we, we, we the GIs, the, the, the soldiers didn't like him. But that's part of my life there. And, and it's, it's, it's still, it still bothers me that nobody, half the people I talk to don't know what happened to General Pat. There's there's the book right there, and you know, I have the I have the map where he got killed and all that stuff. Wow. And, like I said, he had been in my camp or by my camp just about an hour before he got killed. He traveled about thirty five miles, and there was the accident occurred. Pretty ironic how someone of such stature kind of passes That's, in such a manner, huh? He he was a top general. He was the famous, most top general in the world. They respected him for that. I don't know, later on, uh, MacArthur came up and all that stuff like that, but, but in our area it was General Patton. He was moving tank trucks. And uh, that's, that's, that's part of my life. And I guess the good Lord brought me back so I can talk to you people about it. <laughs> what year were you born? I was born April 27, 1925. Mm -hmm. So growing up, were you aware of the Great Depression? How's that? Were you aware of the Great Depression as you were growing up? Like I said, there was no money, but there was plenty of eggs and milk, and we had a lot of fun hunting at night. We, we went out hunting rabbits and armadillos, armadillos and... and uh, we were already trained. By the time we went into the army, we were trained to live hard and, and move around at night in the woods and all that stuff. So uh, it was hard for some of the, uh, my comrades from the north, Pennsylvania, New York, and those areas there. They were crying like a bunch of babies. And, uh, and uh, it was an adventure for us, really. When you're 18 and 19 or young, you don't mind going anywhere, up in the mountains or anywhere, because you like adventure. And we hadn't gone as far as 50 miles away from the ranch there going up. 
So when we had a chance to move out, we thought we were, we were all, we didn't know where we were going to get into. <laughs> so we moved on to, to <laughs> when we were getting shot at, we were crying too, you know. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> Seeing our friends get killed and all that stuff. And our, our orders was kill or be killed. Get in there and kill or be killed, you know. And then uh, at one time we were not moving fast enough. And General Patton came by and said, you people are not moving fast enough. Move, move. I don't care if they kill every one of you. You've got to move. Because he wanted for us to move before the Russians. Because the Russians were taking the, the biggest part of Germany. And he didn't want that. He wanted for us to take Berlin. We, we didn't go all the way to Berlin. The Russians beat us. They came and surrounded Berlin and came all the way. But, but the Russians were a lot of fun. When we, when we met with the Russians in Nuremberg, we said, we didn't know a word they were saying and they didn't understand us. <laughs> How many languages do you speak? I don't, barely speak English and barely speak Mex. Mex. <laughs> I speak Tex Mex. <laughs> You said you learned a little German, though? <laughs> no, I freaking do it. 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 and stuff like that. A little French. Every time we went in there, Belgium. And yes, yes. But we, we, were, we were moving around okay. I, I, I hadn't had any problem moving around in Europe. I, I, in fact, I went to Switzerland looking for a friend of mine that got killed, that he was related to me. He came from my little town of Benavides. He was flying and they knocked his plane down. He, he fell somewhere in France and nobody... He had three sisters and they were very good, close to us and my sister. My sister wrote a letter say, Lupe is missing in action and we haven't heard from him for two years, two and a half years. And the sisters are all want to know where, where he is, and and I don't know from where. I hopped my jeep and went to Switzerland. When I have heard that in Switzerland, there was a international Red Cross headquarters that's supposed to have all the information of persons at war enemies or whatever. So, so I don't know from where I, I, I decided to go down there and, and went to Switzerland and into the International Headquarters of Red Cross in Geneva. And I, I gave them the information where he was from, in Texas and where he came from and all that. They look it up, they found him in a civilian cemetery in France and uh, they don't know if he, he got killed coming down his plane was shot down and he came down somewhere in a small town in, in uh, France and uh, so I picked up the information and, and, and sent it back to my sister and, and she told the girl and that's that was one deed that I did there that I don't know how I still think, how did I get over there? I don't know. How did I manage to go into Switzerland? They wouldn't allow an American vehicle going to Switzerland. So I had to leave the, the Jeep in a small farm in, in the border of Switzerland and I had to leave it there and catch a train into Switzerland and went to Geneva. And now I think, without knowing their language or nothing, without having to speak or no money, how did I get all around there? I don't know. I don't know how. <laughs> all I know is I did it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I must have. Many things that happened during my time I don't know how I got out of it or how I managed to 
go through it. Yeah. Um. It, it, I'm sure that they, you would hear a lot of stories of. Uh, it, it bothers me that for many years, 20, 30 years, when we came back, nobody wanted to talk about anything. I don't know what happened to us. We didn't. Like I said, I didn't even know my brother was brought back because I, I, I was being reported in the hospital. And uh, I just found out about five years ago because he told me, he says, you know, he brought me back home and I didn't know why. <laughs> he said, because you were dying in the hospital. I ended up in England. Let me tell you another thing. I, I, I got out of the hospital and they told me, you have uh, 10 days to go and report back to your, to your company in, in Germany. That's another thing. I traveled from England in 10 days. I had to go all the way across the, across the English Channel and go back to, my, to catch up with my company in, in, in Germany. I did it. I, I ended up over there because when I was in England, I got out of the hospital and I didn't know what to do. I said, what am I going to do with 10 days? And I didn't know anybody. I was by myself. I went to a, to a theater. There was a real nice looking young lady that was selling the tickets. So. I, I said, well, I'll just crawl into that theater and spend some time there. So I talked to her a little while and said, yeah, I need 10 days. I got to stay somewhere and I got to go back to Germany. No, 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 you don't go back to Germany because they, they kill you. See, they didn't kill you the first time and they'll kill you the second time. So she said, you stay here with me and I'll take, to, I'll take you to my house. And you stay there with us. So, after the, he said, I'll get out at 10 o'clock from the movies, from the, from my work. She was working there. She was the ticket salesman. And, and she said, you go with me and we'll keep you there. You don't have to go back. I said, I have to go back. I, I'm not going to desert the army. I'd be a deserter and I don't want to do that. So she took me, we hop on a train, and she took me up north of England, way, way back there, away from the English Channel, to a farmhouse that her uncle or somebody lived over there. So we went all the way, all night, that train went up north of England. And uh, say you stay here with us, and nobody's going to know what that you're not going back to the war. So she left to work the second day, I guess. And I said, I gotta, they're going to kidnap me. I, I better, I better keep out of here. I better get out, get out of here. So, I, <laughs> so, so when when everybody went to work, I I decided I better go look for that train. I didn't even know where the train was at. But I knew, I'm like the cat, I already knew my directions. I came from that direction, I'm going to go back that way. So I went back to the, to the train. And the train makes a stop every 20, 30 minutes. It's a train that runs from the north to the south of England. I hop in the train and it says, where's the ticket? I said, I don't have no ticket, but I, I got to go back to the to France, and uh, so anyway, they, the conductor let me in, and I went, catch on, go on. So I ended up, came back. See, at that time, the Germans were bombing London and Birmingham also. They were, at night, it was blackout. You had to, at, at seven or 10, eight o'clock, you had to blackout. So, uh, so I, I can go to London because they're bombing that place. <laughs> I said, I better not. So I, 
So I went all the way to, I was getting by with the Red Cross and donuts and coffee that they, they were serving for the, for the military. And, 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 and that's how, and they used it. We were, I said, we don't talk about homeless. We were homeless. I was homeless because I didn't know. I had to find a cot to sleep or a place to sleep and, and a place to eat. So, so I say, I'm running out of time. I have to go back to Germany. So I, I, I went across the English Channel again. I, I crossed the English Channel four times. And I, at that time, I didn't have no more, nobody I, I knew or that I had been related with and nothing. I was like a, like a alley cat, just on my own. And I got back to there and I went back to, and went and caught up, and went all the way to Nuremberg, Germany. And that's when I was sent back to Frankfurt to manage that transportation company. And, uh, and I think I did a good job because I had a colonel and a captain, and they never bothered me for anything. They, 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 they said that I was doing a very good job, and I could get my jeep and go just almost anywhere I wanted, and they didn't interfere with me at all for anything. I, I had, uh, I had this German guy have some. Uh, a uniform fixed for me as a ATO jacket and, and tailor-made boots and I didn't want to, I shouldn't say this, but we were having trouble getting liquor. And that German said, look, why don't we make our own liquor? I said, I said what do I need? I said, get me this and this and stuff. So I hustled up and went and got all the stuff he needed. In three days, we were, we were making our own whiskey. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was close to, close to Thanksgiving, and I had to keep my boys happy, you know. And I was running out of food or drinks, and this, this German says, I know where there's a cellar in, in uh, Heidelberg, I think it was. No, not Heidelberg. Somewhere close to Frankfurt. Small town. Those small towns were not bombed. They were only the industrial cities were took the bombing, the real heavy bombing. And and the, the small towns still had champagne, cognac, and the cellars. Most houses were there cellars. And and we went to a cellar and there was a lot of cognac and everything. Uh, 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 Beverages to drink, so I brought a jeep loaded with with goodies for for a test given for my drivers. Why well, they love me, <laughs> and, and uh, but I had to do a little trading. I had to take some some sugar and they, the Germans when the war ended, they didn't have anything to eat. There was nothing to eat, not even paper. To, uh, they, 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 were, they were having a hard time because, like I said, they didn't, they, there was no meal, no electricity, no nothing. It, it was very hard for the civilian people. And, uh, uh, and we, we kind of black market a little bit. I don't know. I don't know how I never got caught, but it was, it was uh, like I said, I didn't know what I should talk about here or not, but it's too late now to do anything. <laughs> I mean, we got you now. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was something else. I, I got to get along real good with the German people. I didn't have no problem as to the war. Uh, we had some, we had 80 or 100 Germans working for us, but 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 I put put it in line right quick. I said we're we're civilized people and we're not going to do anything. You just you, we won the war. You do what we tell you to do and move. And they were supposed to be off the streets 
before dark. There was a curfew. And they would have to be or get shot. Because that was that, that was the orders. If, if somebody was out in the street, you shoot him. And they and and they had to crawl into some small building or something as soon as it turned dark. So later on, we gave them a little longer. We we, we moved the curfew to to about nine nine o'clock, about eight thirty. It, at first, it was seven o'clock. So so they were the orders was to 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 shoot anybody out in the street because you know the work had just ended. And, and I guess for safety of a fireman, and we had to do that because we didn't, we didn't know how far we could trust the Germans. But they were very good people. They surrendered and they, they didn't, I never had any problem, just a few of them. But we, we got real hard with them and we showed them that we meant business. We, we were just, if they did what we tell them to do and move wherever they were supposed to move, they they, they obeyed and like I said, some of them, some of them did did uh, didn't like that and they they were rebels and that caused a little problem. But that was it. I came back to re, after a year. Uh, I was offered to to be a full master sergeant at, at my place because they needed my services and they didn't want me to leave. See, if, if I would sign up for two more years, they would make me a full sergeant, a master sergeant, give me three ranks. And, and I thought about it real hard. I said, well, if I stay here three more years, two more years, I'll never get to go home. Because I had some girlfriends there, and uh, and I, I, I got scared. I said, if I stay here another two years, I, I, I don't think I'll go home. I got to like it. I got to like that. I got along with the Germans real well. So. How does this all begin? Before our interview, we were talking about your schooling. So you went to school there in Benavides? Yes. Uh, you did elementary? Eighth grade. Up to eighth grade. And I came, I took this, I heard about this school over here for, for aircraft engines. And I came and I passed the test and I, I came out real good, doing good grades. Then I offered to, to do some work at the, for aircraft engines. So you dropped out of school when At the eighth grade. In eighth grade. How was your I could I, when we came back we were offered to go back to school. But we started running around wild like crazy and we I went up to Mexico and I went to Colorado for many years and I I uh, I, I went roaming around for about three years and and uh I used to climb mountains. I used to like the mountains. I went to high mountains in Mexico, and I went to the mountains in Colorado and all that area there. And then after that, I, my wife hooked me up and I got married. And <laughs> that was the end of my party. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take you back to your schooling years. Were those segregated schools? No. Do you remember where the the school that you did elementary was it a segregated were you segregated from other no we were, were it, 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 Mexican it was a public school mm -hmm. in in Benavides mm -hmm. the were they the majority were ninety percent Mexican ninety percent well, ninety five maybe mm -hmm. back that way what was the other five percent Germans and you know no 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 here in Benavides German growing people growing up. British and Irish and Germans and Italians. There was a, a fa Italian family there. In fact, there was a German family that before I left, they, they arrested them because they were spying for Germany. Mm -hmm. But mostly immigrants, European immigrants. No, they weren't Americano or they were German farmers. They had a okay. big farm there in Benavides, mm -hmm. but they caught them. The old man was spying for it. For, for, for the Germans. And then later I came to Corpus when I was in school and they arrested another couple of them over here. 
One was arrested there in North Beach, where he 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 was uh, sending messages to the to the German submarines that were in the Gulf. Because the German submarines were heavy at that time, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. There was, I think, I think there was fifteen submarines in the Gulf of Mexico, and and there was only about eight or ten in the Atlantic. But they were bombing a lot of people. They were bombing, uh, destroying transportation and all kinds of shipping out. And it was uh, when I left, they were they were blowing up many merchant ships going to Europe. And uh, when we went across, like I was, it was blackout, and I was assigned to a gun. And we were firing the gun, practicing, and we we fired the gun just to scare off the submarines and the Germans. You know, we were afraid that they would come. And we we were we were protected by blimps. About about two days out of out of New York, we were covered by by by, by blinks, and then nothing there for about. A couple of days, and then we were closer to Europe, and then they were they were covering up for us from Europe, and uh, it was very hard going across because we were packed with a lot of people, and and the food was terrible. We got only two two bowls of dirty water soup from the from the British. The British were supposed to feed us. And they were not giving us any good soup. They couldn't find nothing but like dirty dishwash water. And it was <laughs> the two, two, two soup bowls a day. <laughs> so, so I guess. Did you think of the food back home? <laughs> well, we were thinking at night you'd be asleep and you'd be. You'd be dreaming the good, <laughs> dreaming back home, you know. Dreaming mom's home cooking. <laughs> yeah, tortillas. <laughs> How was that for you, the whole food experience? Um, was it, how, how, how did that affect you? Um, the change in the eating habits? You, can, you couldn't be sure about anything. You know? we, were, we were, Growing up, kids, we were, we were just, like I said, we were just, uh, it was an adventure for us, you know, we, we survived on anything. We, it affected you naturally, you get hungry and all that stuff, and there was no HBs or no burgers or anything around, especially in Europe, there was nothing to eat out there in Europe. Europe is, is. but uh, it was an adventure, okay. All right, you know, it was, it was a, um, a, like a dream. I'm sorry. So you, um, so you drop out of school in eighth grade. You go to the the mechanic school. Um, were your friends also doing the same thing? Did your friends also drop out, or who were your friends well, at that I, time? I saw all my schoolmates leaving before I did. And they were all going. Everybody wanted to go. It was nothing to do. They were eat rabbits and whatever. And uh, like I said, before then, I'd never been further than 50 miles from the little town. We didn't have any cars. We just had a wagon, and and, and we were uh, we were anxious to to, to go and and. Investigate whatever. So, how old were you when you enlisted? Seventeen years old, and uh, and and most of my friends had already left. I have at least there. Sixteen of my schoolmates got killed, never came back. I was just one of the fortunate guys that that was able to come back. You and your brother both. Mm -hmm. So you volunteered. I volunteered to go to, to, to the Air Corps 
but they told me that that there was no room in the Air Corps. I had to go to the infantry training, so I ended up in the infantry. And they didn't give me a choice but send me back to, straight to the front, where they were needing they were needing replacements because our boys were getting killed. We we lost we lost thirty thousand in one battle. And uh, it's, yeah. It was 30,000, I think it was uh, when the Battle of the Bulge, we, we lost 30,000 killed and, and wounded, casualties. And we, the Germans came and attacked us. Wait a minute. Yeah, the Germans came and attacked us with 30,000 men, seven, 700 tanks and 1,000 big guns. That was, that was December the 16th at the Battle of the Bulge, when the Battle of the Bulge started. And I was very lucky to, to be assigned to one side of the bed of the Bulge because the, the inside, when we came across the German path, there was burning vehicles, tanks, our vehicles. Man killed, a lot of men killed. The, the Germans came in and like a storm. That was their last straw, their last chance to to cut us off and, and beat us. That was why it was called the Battle of the Bulge. I got a, a brown star for fighting the Battle of the Bulge. But like I said, I was assigned to one, one, one side, the north side of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we were assigned to the British side. The British were on the north and we were on the south. And we fought along with the British there on that area. And uh, survived that one. It was very hard because it started snowing and, and cold. And we had to spend a lot of time in the cold. And the, uh, many times, the, for a week or two, it dropped down to about zero weather, and we didn't have no warm place to stay. It was, it was. Uh, we couldn't light a, a a fire. We couldn't start a fire. We started a fire one time because we were about to die, and uh, the captain came by and said, "Put that fire out, or, or we're going to shoot you." So we had to, we had to turn the fire off. And they wanted to shoot it, and. Uh, and we were just going through the woods and sleeping wherever we could stay together, two or three of us, to survive that that severe cold. It was it was for that lasted about seven days. Everything froze, even our guns froze. And and the Germans, uh, if the Germans knew that, see, our guns were not even. We had to click the guns every 20, 30 minutes to keep them working because they were froze. See, I, they, we didn't know that either, that, that our oil was not for zero weather. And the Germans and the Russians had special oil. So we didn't know that. I, I found out that later. And when they, when they started freezing, it, it said, if the Germans know that we can fighting this kind of weather, they're going to take us, they're going to take us, you know. So we had to find ways to survive. It was bitter, bitter. I, many times, as soon as the sun going down, I would say my prayers that I wouldn't be alive in the morning. Uh, that's, that's the way it was. You described that, how, how would you sleep in that weather? You said that Three of you would get together? Three or four. About two or three of us would crawl in a hole or a trench and we would stay together uh, trying to, to get by the cold. It was, it was severe, very cold, very, very cold. Uh, Christmas morning, Christmas morning had about, about a foot of snow. And all that. Snow coming in here, and 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 with the 
with the body heat, you, it, it wick, our clothes would froze. Every time you move, your, your clothes would go. It, it, it was very, very cold. We lost a lot of men because of the cold. Uh, trench foot and, and frozen feet, frostbite. Uh, yeah, they, they couldn't take it. It, it was it was a, that it was very hard there. I spent Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year. It, it was very cool. Did fighting the cold almost make you somehow maybe forget about the fighting that was also going on? Because just trying to survive the cold itself, or were you scared also of the fighting itself that's looming? Or, or how, how did that affect the morale of the soldiers and stuff like that? Very low. It, 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 the Germans were going through the same thing. They were having a hard time moving. We couldn't move, move around either. And we were almost to a stand there. But we were still shooting at each other, you know. They, we were getting artillery, artillery shots and we were getting a gun, enemy gun and fire all the time. But we were not afraid of the guns anymore. We were afraid of the cold. We were actually, we were, it was that cold. It was, it was terrible, terrible. There wasn't that weather here in Benavides? Mm -hmm. There was never that type of weather here in Benavides? We never saw snow before. <laughs> and there was snow before. We go over there and got a foot of snow. It was. The snow was almost to our waist there for a while, and, and we were there uh, without any hot meals or nothing. They couldn't, we, they couldn't, they couldn't get in in there. It was uh, it was about two three weeks that, or maybe uh, they were dropping food from the air. We were getting uh, C rations, K rations. At night, a, a plane would fly by. And drop some some food for us, and then we had to go out at night or or looking around for something to eat. And uh, we were at one. It was for two or three days. We were on D bar. A D bar is a is a bar of chocolate about that size, and and you cut it in in three pieces. That's your breakfast, your dinner, and your and, and and that's how we survived. It was it was uh, many days we didn't get nothing to eat. We had to kill a deer or a cow. There was a, dead horses and cows all the, almost everywhere, you know. But uh, but we couldn't light a fire to cook it. We attempted attempted one time to cook a the cow, and we were just getting ready to eat when, when the captain saw the smoke. He says, you come put that smoke out and move out of here right now. You give up, you give out our position already, and, and we had to move out. So we, I didn't even get to taste one bite of that cow. And we already cut pieces off of it, and, and we got a fire going, and the Germans were right there, and we could hear them. Half a mile from us, they were all. We were all surrounded with Germans because we didn't know. Most of the time, we didn't know where we were at. We didn't have no communications. We had wire phones, and and the Germans would cut them off, cut the wire, and and it was a mess. It was terrible. It, it was like a like a, it, sometimes you would hear the Germans shooting from back that way, and then they would shoot. So that meant that we. Many times we were surrounded by the Germans. We could hear them moving around and talking and all that stuff. And I'm sure that they were hiding out from us too because it was like that, now, that you had to, uh, it, it was, uh, it, it, many days we, we didn't know where we were at. We were just moving through the forest and through the hills. I never got, I never got to fire or to fight. It, a, a lot of my colleagues or my, my partners are, got
got to fight in the city fighting. I fought in small towns, just small towns. And uh, one, one town that we couldn't take, we were having trouble taking it, and we asked for, for air support. And we were up in the hill and we were watching the little town. And we asked for uh, air support. And late that day, almost dark, the air support came in. And they bomb and incendiary bombs and whole little town. And I tell you one thing, uh, that's one thing that still bothers me. We went through that little town after the bombing and all that. There was dead civilians all over the place. You couldn't, you couldn't step three paces without going over a dead body. It was terrible. It was terrible. Uh, I saw four nurses with the Red Cross. They were not supposed to be killed. They were dead. And uh, it was a, it's this one little town that I never forget. It, it was terrible. And then we felt, I felt bad because we we asked for for air support, and they 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 came in and bombed that little place up and down for about it lasted about an hour or two. But next day we moved into the little town and there was dead people all over the place. And later I found out that the people that were living in the industrial cities or in the industrial areas have moved to small towns where they were not supposed to be bombed. And the little town was full of civilian people. And it had a lot of civilian people and they, and they were dead. Women, men, he was... You, know, you don't see those in the books there. We, you, it's just something else. It was terrible. Anyway. <laughs> Christmas morning, Christmas morning, five of our planes got shot down by the Germans. And I was, I was in a foxhole. It was about three or four feet of snow. And, and the planes were shot down by the Germans, five airplanes. And each plane had eight men at least. They were bombers. But they got shut down and I only saw three parachutes come out. The rest of them blew up in the air like that. On a Christmas morning. And uh, I still Well, anyway, I guess the good Lord give me a chance to come back and talk about it. Because, like I said, for about 30 years, we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to, nobody wanted to say anything. I don't know why. We were, we all grew up and got married and started running around and having a lot of fun, fishing, hunting. And, we didn't, this all started about 10 years ago when we started, they started asking us to come over and, and uh, we have veteran groups that we get together. In fact, I was in one this morning, they had a Korean, you know, Vietnam group. Many of them were committed suicide and all that. And, uh, and I was there this morning to, we started at one o'clock. 
at the VA hospital. And and I have four, we had started with seven, World War II veterans. And, and right now we're down to four. Yeah. And they're dying. All my, all my people are dying. I just lost a cousin of mine three days ago. He was a World War II veteran also. And uh, he was uh, assigned to, to invent the radar machine or the radar that helped us win the war. And he was confined to a building for about three years. He was not allowed to even go to the bathroom without a guard. Because he was a top secret. And they were working on that radar. And he just passed away about three or four days ago. I didn't get to go to his funeral. He, he passed away in Houston. But he was a very intelligent, he was a, uh, Three, three years older than I was. Two or three years older than I was. And uh, I knew uh, uh, he couldn't communicate or go home or nothing for about two and a half years. Confined to a building in uh, somewhere in Louisiana where they were developing the, the radar was an instrument that was very interesting, very important for us to win the war. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mendez, how did your family respond to your decision to enlist? Uh, really, I don't know. We wanted to go and they just let it go, I guess. Nobody wants their kids to go to war, but like I said, my little town was only 1,700 population, and and we lost, I have the list there somewhere, I have the list of all the names. We lost 16 of my schoolmates that didn't come back, some in, in Japan and some in Europe. But I have the list of those young men, I think, there somewhere. And where did you say your basic training was? Camp Fanning. Camp Fanning, Texas. It was, uh, it was uh, 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 40 miles from Dallas, I think. See, this is one. This is one that I, well, I, I guess you have a copy. I made the copy of this. That's, what, that's about mm -hmm. me and me we are going by General Patton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the Battle of the Barge. And, uh, and uh, I guess uh, but I don't have to cover about uh, what, what else took place in those days. He was uh, Uh, Vietnam, when we came back, we were treated like, we, we never were treated fairly. We have a hard time finding jobs, and we couldn't find a good, decent paying job, especially the Mexicanos, you know. In fact, I went to apply for, for a loan to build a home. And they said, no, Mende, we're not making any loans south of San Antonio. I knew the message. I knew why, because we were very many, many Hispanic boys who, who were lost in the war and, and fought in the war. And then we couldn't get a loan. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, we had a hard time getting, getting by. How did that make you feel? Bad, I feel bad, bitter about about that. And 
feel real bad about the way they treated the, the Vietnam guys that came back. This country some, some, has done some bad things that, that, that bother me. But we, we were not good people. It's, uh, it, it has to be told one of the days somebody don't they don't nobody wants to talk about it nobody wants to say it but, but uh, uh, the thousands of boys that we lost in Vietnam to you know the Korean War and the Japanese War also two of two of those boys my schoolmates went down and a ship going to Japan, they they sunk the ship and they went down with it. Mm -hmm. Do you consider the, um, the people, the men that were with you, your friends? Uh, uh, like brothers, I guess. <laughs> the ones that fought together with me, we, we were just like brothers. I mean, we, we, we had to be like brothers, and uh, we we. I had a young man that was there. From Alice, he lives forty miles from here. The the first day we went into a to a to a, to, a uh, to the front line. Uh, he lost a leg. He was there just about one day, and I had another one that was from. I think his name was John from from Arkansas, no, from Pennsylvania. He he joined us. He was there seven hours. He got shot right in the head. And he was bragging. He he came to me because he was a replacement. He says, uh, "I was sent here to fight with you guys." Uh, I said, well, yeah, yeah, uh, John, you got to stay down because they're shooting at us. So how do you know? I said, I know, because I had already heard some shots that they're shooting at us. They know we're here. And I turned around to leave because we were, we were digging a trench so we could spend the night there. And I was digging a little bit and I said, you're going to dig now. And I turned around to walk away and I went, Pack! and he was hit right in the head. Started jumping up and down, and he was dead in about three minutes. And he was there only seven hours. And he was telling me, "Look, I didn't come over here." He was about two, three years old, and I was. He said, "I didn't come over here because I was in college, and they gave me." A, I said, "I just got out of college, and they sent me over here." And, they, and he says, "Look at my ring and all that." You know, that I just got out of college and, and they sent me over here. And uh, and he was killed. That seven hours, six, seven hours, he was dead. All the way over there to go all the way down there just to get killed. In like many cases like that, I saw many cases like that. I had a friend, I had a friend from, uh, from Del Rio. He had four kids, but he was, he was, in the, he was in the late 40s, he was about 40 years old. He said, you guys are a bunch of kids, you better, you're too stupid and too dumb, and he, he that's the way he, you guys stay back there, don't move, don't move, they're going to kill you. And uh, he was telling us that, when a German opened up fire on us from a machine gun, he was shooting at us. He said, you all stay here and don't move. I'm going to sneak around and go to get him. So he went a little ways and got cut under the machine gun fire. We killed right there. And uh, we went over to try to help him out. Luckily, the Germans, we started firing at the machine gun. And, and they scared and, and left. They moved back. And they left the they left the machine gun there, and and we were able to go and try to help Vitela Alfredo, his, his name, he was a Mexican guy. He was a tough guy. He was a good 
fighter, but like I said, he had four kids. Yeah. He got he was dead in the right quick. He, he got three or four shots in the, the stomach on the shit, and he, he died. And uh, in many cases like that, what I saw, it, it was very hard to forget those forget those uh, kind of people that were that didn't get to come back. Didn't get to come back. Did you support the war effort? Well, some people say we had to have wars to control the 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 population. <laughs> I don't know. But what's the saying? We fought Germany. Germany is, we're borrowing Ger money from Germany. We fought the Germans and we were living there with them, killing each other and all that. One of my trucks went to Nuremberg. I sent it. They asked for a truck to move some stuff, supplies. So I sent one of my trucks out. When he came back, he said, you know, man, this, you know what I was bringing back? He says, gold bars. He said, I had, I said, they look like bricks, but they were gold. <laughs> yeah. They were moving gold bars from Nuremberg back to Frankfurt because the, Ger the Russians were coming, trying, trying to get there first. And I guess they were afraid that they, they were fighting over the gold bars because and later on they were fighting about statues that they stole from Italy and from France, from Paris. And I don't know how they settled it either, but that's what we were seeing. That's the kind of stuff that was going on. Were most of the men in, in your were you in your battalion of Mexican descent? When I went in we were we were about, I would say about half of, half of the hundred men there that went in there one time when I went in. Because they were sending replacements, you know, and we were, we were in 80 or 100 or 150 at one time. <clears throat> and we were brought into the front lines, and we were about 100. But in, in less than a week, I couldn't count where half of them, but we lost track of them. Uh, they would get shot, and they, uh, and they would be moved to other regiments, uh, battalions, and regiment and company. So uh, we we separated. In, in no time, I, I couldn't count on one of them. I couldn't find none, none of them. But but we left from a group from South Texas, and we were sixty or eighty percent Mexican. Panics. Did you face any challenges overseas because you were of Mexican descent? No, over there we were all, all, we call each other Italian and Jews and we were, we were, you know, like that. They call me Spick and I call the other one German. So in one case I had a German, a German fighting with us in, in my company. When we went into Germany, I don't know how it came out that that hey, hey, I don't remember what his name was. They come and say, "Hey, uh, your dad. We caught your dad yesterday. He's a prisoner. His dad was a German officer, and he was fighting with us. He was fighting against his dad. It, it, those things. I saw a couple of those cases where 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 they were." Germans fighting against Germans. Our Germans fighting against against the. But I guess that's the way it was in Mexico too. You know, when the Civil War and the Mexican War. The Civil War, they were brothers and cousins fighting against each other. Isn't that right? Uh, that's what I read about the Civil War. Our Civil War. Relatives fighting against each other. I had a German, a German, uh, 
real good friend, a colonel, a colonel, a, a, our colonel. He, he said, my brother is in Frankfurt. He's a German officer. And and he was sent to, as a colonel, he was sent to Japan because he couldn't be sent to Germany because his brother was over there. He was here from Corpus, Ulrich, Ulrich brothers. There's two brothers, Ulrich brothers. They were engineers. It, it, many cases like that. But you know, like I said, we were we were all brothers. We were all brothers fighting in the war. Uh, we had some Jew boys that didn't want to fight, and they were treated real bad by by some of my officers. And in fact, for when one of them was going to be killed by one of my officers. Because he didn't want to go, in, to, he didn't want to move to fight in the front line. He said, "I didn't know that either. That the United States had told the Jews that they didn't have to go to a war to the front line, they didn't, and uh, it made us real mad because we were over there trying to save them, trying to liberate them." And then they didn't want to join and fight with us. And they said that they they were not supposed to be in the front line. And this guy was, there was two Jews there that didn't want to fight. And one of my sergeants started to beat him up. And he, and he beat him up so bad that he fell. And he started kicking him with his combat boots, you know. He, he said, I'm going to kill him. And I jumped in and said, no, 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 you don't kill that guy. You're not going to kill him with your boots. He, uh, and he pointed a gun at me. He was, he said, he went to shoot me. He said, he said don't, I don't want you to do that. So I saved that boy. I said, he, he, but the, this, this uh, soldier, a friend of mine, I was an officer. He was a sergeant. He was a, he was like crazy already, you know. After a while in war, they call it battle fatigue, or they get they get real ugly. They could turn around and shoot anybody, and they 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 go crazy. And this guy was already crazy. He was crazy. He wanted to kill that that Jew boy. Yeah. Many cases like that, and it, it, you can imagine when you're up there and everybody's got a gun and knife and all that kind of stuff, and hungry and mad. I'm sure, I'm sure that many of our men got killed by friendly fire, by our own men. Yeah. Because things like that happen in war. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, Mr. Mendes, when do you, where were you when you hear that it's over? Well, there's, there's, there's books, everybody writes books, you know. There's a book there that says when it was over, and another book says... Uh, Where were you? How did you uh, receive the news? We didn't know it was over. We just kept moving, and we were on... Uh, and in fact, we, we somebody sent us some questionnaire about what were you doing when the war ended? Half of us didn't even know the war had ended, you know. Some, they call it a certain date or a certain hour, but, but we just, we didn't have any communications and we were not, we just kept fighting and, and finally when I approached uh, Nuremberg, uh, I was, we were told that the war was over and the Russians started coming into our territory and, and we started kissing each other and hugging each other and partying and, and I thought, I said, I thought the Mexicans were crazy, but these Russians were. <laughs> these Russians were. <laughs> they were jumping up and down like roosters, and, like, and they were drinking a lot of vodka. And they had the vodka. And they had the vodka. That's why we we went to go kiss them and all that, <laughs> and we started drinking. It was for two or three days. We were partying, and 
everybody out of control, you know, nobody has any, any, it was a crazy thing, and drinking a lot of, a good friend of mine from Alabama, in fact, I, I never remember his name, called him Alabama, no, no, wait a minute, Georgia, Georgia, he was from Georgia, and he was always with me, and we were drinking that night, and he took some drink that killed him. He died that night. Yeah. We lost uh, 15 or 16 men uh, parting with the Russians. And I heard that the Russians lost 30 or 35. So they survived the war. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then. Yeah. Because the Germans gave us a lot of snobs. Cognac, another called bus bomb Jews. They were feed, they were giving us poison, poison. And they knew we were going to drink it, and we would start drinking stuff that some of them were drinking that poison still. And I was very careful. I was very careful. I said, No, I'm not going to drink anything that I don't know what I'm drinking. And that's why I'm still here. <laughs> Stick to the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> well, the vodka is good. <laughs> but, um, but, but that's why I said. Twenty. Okay. Um. So, what is your reaction when they say you're going home? I didn't get that. I oh. didn't. I didn't get to hear those words. So then, how do you end up coming back? Well, I wasn't doing my duty in Frankfurt and and according to the battle stars that you have and the Purple Heart I get I got to come home before men that were there three or four years because I, I was involved with a lot of this stuff and and we, we they, they count points or give us time to come home and I was I, I earned enough points to come home right quick and uh, but I didn't want to call him yet. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's a matter of, you got enough, you can go home whenever you want. So, so I, I had a hard decision to make. Like I said, I was, I was, uh, I was offered to, to move up three ranks and, and stay there two more years if I was signed for two, for two more years. And I, I just said, it was, if I stay two more years, I don't know if I'm going home or not because I had a little girl over here in trouble and all that stuff. And, and I said, I, I didn't even tell her. I just sneak out and, and pack up my packs and, 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 and left. Just ended up in the, in the Lahar, uh, in, in the English Channel. And, and the first ship that was coming home, I was going to get in it. So I was. I came back in a small uh, liberty ship. It, it took us 16 days across the, <laughs> to get over here. <laughs> took us forever. And uh, and then the other work, the, without taking a shower and all that stuff, I tell you. That. And then we we arrived in New York, and and we anchored close to the Statue of Liberty. And we were there for two days and you know, looking at the cars and the traffic and, and they, wouldn't let us, they wouldn't bring us in. The ship was not, there was not enough, at the harbor there was not enough room or something. And they kept us there for two days and, and two nights I guess. Because I remember at night seeing all the people moving around and the lights everywhere and we were stuck in that damn boat. for. <laughs> So close, but so far. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at the looking at the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> what a what a journey. And then the how was the welcome back home? So what month is this when, when I, you come back to the when, when I got home, mm -hmm. I crawled into my room and I didn't come out for about a. My mother was very worried. I don't know what happened. I, I, I cried. I remember. 
she was she was beginning to worry a lot because the, most of us, my brother did the same thing. We come in and we we didn't want to come. We didn't want to go anywhere. I'm just trying to. I don't know what happened to people. And, but she she got worried. And then some of my friends started coming over looking for me, and we started going out and drinking a few beers. And then we were we, we started going out every day drinking. We were drinking real heavy at that time. We started drinking and drinking. To try to forget the. Uh, yeah. I guess most of the Vietnam veterans, Korean veterans, went through the same thing, you know. But many of them didn't get to talk about it. It's still funny that I don't. I don't get to talk to. I, I, I meet every week over here in Delmar with a group also. And uh, but they. These guys were mostly Navy guys and pilots, and they didn't go through what we went through. Mm -hmm. But we get we get a few that would. But it's funny; many of my friends don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk too much about what went on. They just they just it, it was like a like a dream, I guess. I don't know what happened to me, but I'm I'm, I'm speaking up now because I'm gonna be gone pretty quick, and and if I don't, I just say it the way it is, you know. Because I think people need to know about it. Yeah. When and where did you meet your wife? I had about five girlfriends when I got back. I was better looking than that guy. Is it? Well, that's not too. That's not saying too much. <laughs> <laughs> Look at there. That's when I get back. Oh. <laughs> oh. Not saying too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know when you're young. Yeah. So where did you meet her? Well, I had to make a hard choice. I had about five. And I thought you had a little bit of money and oil, and <laughs> I said, I guess you took it. <laughs> Your father had a little oil well down there, and, and a piece of land there, and I, I was trying to, <laughs> no, no. She hooked up to me, and she didn't let me go, 62 years. She just passed away about four years ago. That's her right there. Mm, beautiful. So. She's from Corpus Benavides? Or Alice. From Alice. Mm -hmm. So where'd you meet her? In Alice. She was a, a city secretary. She was, when I met her, she was there with the city manager. She was secretary for the city manager of Alice. She did a lot of work for me. She did, she wrote a lot. She used to run my business over here too. She used to run the office. And, uh, so how many children do you have? Two. Mm -hmm. This is my little grandkids. Okay. Are your children here? Are they? Uh... Yeah. One well, of them just left before you got here. He's a. Oh, so you have a. You had a boy and a girl. Two boys. Two boys. Mm -hmm. Do they both live in Corpus? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, that's my life. What did what coming back from the war? What did you where where do you start I, working? Or? I worked for the navy. I worked for the navy two years, and uh, I didn't like the way I was treated there, and I and I quit, and I I, I opened my own business. I went the business on my own. What is your business? Uh, automatic transmissions. I had I opened a sh an automatic transmission shop. I operated forty years. Uh, and uh, I travel quite a bit uh, because I, in my business, uh, I took all the holidays off and a lot of time and, uh, for myself. I did. I didn't. You know, some people would get into a business and they would work day and night for seven days a week, and I don't. 
I was not that way. I, I, I knew I was, I needed time to enjoy myself. And, and look at that. Perks of being your own boss, huh? Yeah. Mm. And, and my wife, you stay in the office, and she runs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was a boss. I had a good wife because she, some wives don't do that, you know. They ain't gonna put up with that. It's just a friend of mine lost his wife not very long ago because he, he said, how come you lost your wife? I said, well, uh, her mother-in-law came by and said, aren't you gonna buy her a, a dishwasher and machine? He said, no, well, what should I buy? I, that's why I married her, she's gonna work the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> so the mother-in-law took his daughter and said, they get out of here, this guy is. <laughs> He's still by himself. <laughs> um, I got about 10 minutes left okay. in this car. Is there anything, what message do you have for... I have a message that the United States should be United States, not divided states. And we need to get together and work for that. We went to war and we fought for this country, and we need the people to, to do the right thing. We need to be strong. We need to, we need to, if we're divided, we're going to be conquered. Somebody's going to come in and conquer us. I'm afraid of that, that that, that will happen if we don't unite ourselves in infrastructure for the country build more better roads, dams, and these people are spending a lot of money fighting each other, and they're not going to get us out of the big problem that exists. We've got to stop the drugs. We don't want no drugs in this country. That's why these people are coming in with drugs, because the people over here are buying the drugs. We are buying the drugs. The people are... We need to find a way to do the right thing because I don't like what I see and I'm not going to be here to see it, but but I feel sorry for my new generation. I, I think that we need to do something and uh, I don't know how we're going to do it, but, but we need to do what's right, respect each other. In, because our new generation are going to suffer. I saw people like, like Hitler was saying that they were going to be the super race and that they were going to ruin this. Look what he did to his people. Look what he did to his people. When the war ended, they didn't have a place to go to the bathroom. They didn't have no paper. They didn't have nothing to eat. And that's what it ends up like. And, I, I, and if we don't do the right thing, we, we might have to go to that road. And I don't want our, our new generation, our, our kids to go through that. It's not what, not good what I'm seeing, it's not good. And uh, I wish I could change it or find a way to change it or that. But, our leaders are spending a lot of money, a lot of time fighting each other. And they're all a bunch of lies, they're lying. The lawyers are cheating and stealing and the doctors are doing the same. And I hear a lot about education. Education is not just They educate themselves to, to run over somebody else and, and do the wrong thing. And uh, I never had money. I never had big money. I never was able to make big money I, I, because I, I would donate and I would help people and I was always spending money. I traveled to Washington two or three times and I went to I spent a lot of my time trying to 
help people and unite people. I was a, a member of the National Urban Coalition, and, uh, and I was representing the, the Southwest. And uh, and I I had a every two weeks I have a meeting in Phoenix or in Denver or in El Paso, but I had to go down and talk to people to see if I could get them to to do the right thing, you know. And uh, it, it took a lot of my time, a lot of my business time, and all that. But like I said, I, I never never cared about making big money because I've seen a lot of my friends who made big money, and they they didn't know how to use it, and they they died, and they never did anything for nobody, and, and it's just not very many, many weeks ago, three four weeks ago, a good friend of mine, multimillionaire, and he bought a home over there in Ocean Drive, and and uh, he didn't take anything. He, he was ninety two. And he passed away, and it was, but I, 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 I had a lot of friends like that, that they they thought money was going to be salvation, and I don't think so. I don't think like that. Just enough to get by and enjoy your life, because life is not that long. It will not be helping you at all to take, to pile up the money and it, 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 uh, it kills a lot of people too. They get greedy and they get, they get ugly. I've seen a lot of that. Many of my friends that made big money, they didn't enjoy themselves. I enjoy myself. I don't have no complaints about, about the way I spend my money. I, like I said, I want to travel. I travel. I, I like nature. I like to see the mountains. I like. Uh, I donate to the nature uh, parks, national parks, <clears throat> and uh, because uh, I believe in that, that that our kids deserve something good. We need to do something. <sighs> like I said, I wish I wish I knew how to do it, but but I, it bothers me to see what direction we're taking because I feel for my the new generation. You know, it, it's a uh, the world the the world was was here for everybody, for all of us, to enjoy it. The, 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 uh, 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 God made this world perfect. We have three seasons, four seasons. We have beautiful, we have bad weather, hot weather, cold weather. We have mountains, we have birds, we have fish. We can enjoy it. It's, it's for us to enjoy it. So you can't just find a job and then and then and then forget about your own life because it's gonna run out, and run out. I never thought I'd be ninety, and I'm already there. It's already there. It's all gone. It's, I never thought I would be. Never. I know when I was fifty years old or forty years, I never thought I was gonna get old. You say, wait a minute, when did that happen? <laughs> that's how it is for most. <laughs> I got about three minutes left. Okay. Do I need to stop it? No, we're good. Here? Okay. Yes. It was, uh... I got recognized by the county and by the state and by the...
She's a basketball coach right now. She's coaching in Dallas. Oh. And that's a little goat. Mm -hmm. I have. Look at the little goat. Everything was so good. Uh, 